الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ وعلیٰ علیہ صاحب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ومن احسن قال ممن دعا الى الله و آمن صالح و قال انن من المسلمین رب شلی صدری و یسلی عمری وحل العقدت من لسانی افقہ و قولی I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla and the Peace TV Chinese as well as the viewers on my four social media platforms which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram and Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be on all of you. I welcome you to this program Ask Dr. Zakir Season 5 Session 3. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have posed you and you are unable to reply. You can ask any question which you find on the media which you require a clarification this is the opportunity. You can ask your question on any of the four social media platforms of mine, but the best would be that you ask your question in brief as a text message on the WhatsApp. There are more chances that the questions on the WhatsApp will be taken. You're most welcome to mention your question in brief along with your name, your profession, your city and country of origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero, double one two one, double three, double three, six zero. I repeat, plus six zero, double one, two one, double three, double three, six zero. the first question from the WhatsApp. I am Umair from Sri Lanka. I am a student. The government of Sri Lanka has not given the permission for the burial of Muslims who die due to COVID-19. What should we Muslims do for this unjustified case? Till now, more than 100 Muslims were cremated that is burnt. A similar question is asked. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Hussein Mahmood. I am a student studying in a local university. After March, the Sri Lankan government decided to cremate the COVID-19 victim's body regardless of the consent from the family. Our politicians are trying to amend the decision, but we cannot. We want to raise this issue internationally. We want Sheikh to speak about this issue. The question posed by both the questioner were regarding the decision taken by the Sri Lankan government several months earlier in the month of March and April 2020 that all those who die because of COVID-19 or they die after testing positive COVID-19, all of them should be cremated, should be burnt irrespective of their religion, irrespective of the consent of the family. And this decision was mainly taken by the government according to me, was mainly to act against the Muslim. <coughs> and as you will be aware, that the population of the Muslims in Sri Lanka, it is approximately 2.2 to 2.5 million. According to the 2012 census, 9.7% of the population of Sri Lanka were Muslims. Now they'll be somewhere close to 11%. 
in the population in Sri Lanka, about 11% would be Muslims and Christians were 7.4 percent in the 2012 census they'll be close to 7.5 percent now both put together would be 18.5 percent of the population of Sri Lankan they normally bury after they die because of their of their religious teachings whether it be the Muslims or whether it be the Christians the majority of the Sri Lankan they are Buddhist 70.2 percent of the population of Sri Lanka are Buddhist and 12.6 percent are Hindus and both of these communities they cremate after they die I personally feel that this decision taken by the Sri Lankan government was mainly to harass the minorities that is the Muslims and the Christians and though the Muslim politicians they did try their level best and they approached the government and they tried to convince them but the government said that it is not our decision we are not interfering it has been taken by the health authorities they have told that the best to do after a person dies after being tested positive for COVID-19 the safest is to cremate them to burn them so we aren't interfering with the decision it is not our decision it is the decision of the health authorities and we cannot do anything about it later on there were many Muslim lawyers who got together and they even filed a petition in the Supreme Court in the highest authority of law in Sri Lanka but unfortunately it was rejected now when we analyze Sri Lanka is the only country in the world amongst more than 200 countries which have which has got this unique rule that anyone who dies because of COVID-19 should be cremated nowhere else in the world and when we check the WHO requirement they say once a person dies because of COVID-19 it doesn't make a difference whether you bury them or whether you cremate them both are safe so from where do the health authorities of Sri Lanka get this idea that cremating or burning the dead body after they have been tested positive of COVID-19 is safer and better I feel it is just a harassment of the minority there is no medical or scientific proof at all that a dead body after being positive of COVID-19 and they're dying because of COVID-19 they should be cremated it is not at all a scientific fact there is no medical proof at all for it in fact scientifically if we compare the difference between cremation and burial and let me tell you that majority of the people in the world after dying they are being buried because the Christians are approximately 2.5 billion in the world the Muslims are more than 2 billion the, the Christians are approximately 31 percent in the world and the Muslims are more than 25 percent both put together only the Christians and Muslims they are more than 56 percent of the world population and many others are also buried so approximately two-thirds of the world population they are buried if you compare the pros and cons between the burial of a dead body and a cremation of a dead body Point number one, when we cremate or burn the body after the person has died, there is a lot of pollution. So cremation and burning the dead body causes multiple times more pollution. It pollutes the area. There is pollution. As compared to burial, there is no pollution. Alhamdulillah. Number two, when a dead body is buried, uh, when a dead body is cremated, for burning the dead body, a lot of wood has to be burned, because of which millions of trees have to be chopped. In India alone, there are millions of trees every year. They are killed and they are chopped only because they require wood for burning the dead bodies. So the forest is destroyed because of cremation, because of burning the dead body whereas in burial the forest is retained 
the more greenery is retained as compared to cremation. Point number three, when a dead body is buried, the bones they disintegrate, the body gets disintegrated and scientifically today, science tells us that whatever is present in the human body, the components, to a lesser or greater extent, the same components also present in the earth. So as it said in Islam, from earth we come and to the earth we return. So the thing is that it is more scientific to bury a body as compared to cremation. Point number four, when we bury a body, the body disintegrates, the bones disintegrate and it makes that land where the dead body is buried more fertile, which is not the case when a body is burnt, it turns into ashes. When we bury the body, it gives more manure, the earth gets more fertile, there is more greenery, there is more forest, it is much better for the environment. Point number five. the land where you bury, the same land can be recycled. Once you burn the wood in burying a dead body, that wood cannot be used, it turns into ashes. So in burial, it can be recycled. And point number six, it is very cheap. There is no cost required. Once you buy the land and most of the graveyard, they are big, they are bought hundreds of they are present in hundreds of years, the same land can be used after a few years. Whereas in cremation, in burning, it is very expensive, you have to buy wood, it is more expensive to burn a body as compared to burying a body. So scientifically, I have just mentioned six benefits of burying as compared to cremation. Coming back to the question that what the Sri Lankan government has done just to harass the minorities, especially the Muslims and the Christians, what action should be taken? Number one, what the Muslims of Sri Lanka have done, they have approached the political party, is one of the good things they should do. But unfortunately, because the Muslim land minority, they are not as a very good force in terms of convincing the government of being as a vote bank. Point number two, we should go to the legal authorities of the country. And that's what the Muslims in, in Sri Lanka have done. And according to me, though Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan Muslims are minority, compared to other countries, they are quite united, alhamdulillah. So they got together and they filed a case in the Supreme Court. But what happens is that when the government is in majority, and if it's against the Muslims who are in minority, many a times the law supports the government in most of the country. And here, as I mentioned, that the Buddhists, they are 70.2 percent, along with, along with the Hindus, they are 12.6 percent, both put together, they are about 83 percent. So because of this, the Supreme Court, they declined the petition. Third thing that should be done is there should be more awareness that should be made throughout, not only in Sri Lanka, but throughout the world. Because if the world comes to know, surely they can be pressure from outside. Seeing the situation now, what I believe the best that can be done is there should be pressure from the Muslim countries. And Alhamdulillah, there are some Muslim countries which have got active and I've been, touch, I've been in touch with some of the religious people in Sri Lanka. I've been in touch with some of the politicians also in Sri Lanka. And Alhamdulillah, also in some of the NGOs in UK, and there are Muslims who are trying to see to it that the Muslims unite. And this issue also, inshallah, will be brought very soon to the OIC. That is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. But the negative factor is that the Muslims, unfortunately, throughout the world, we aren't united. The Muslims today, about 57 countries in the world, their population is majority they are Muslims. More than 50% of the population of 57 countries in the world, about 27% of the countries in the world, they have a Muslim majority. 
and the Muslim population in the world is more than 2 billion. More than 25% of the world population today are Muslims. But unfortunately today, the Muslims are not united. Many of the Muslim countries, they're fighting among themselves. A neighboring Muslim country is fighting with the other neighboring Muslim country for their personal benefits because of which the Ummah is not united. If the Muslim Ummah was united like it was there in the past, we had one leadership, then the situation would have been different. Now, because the Muslim Ummah is not united and some of the Muslim countries don't want to interfere, they say, okay, it's not concerning ourselves, it's regarding some others, it is totally against the Islamic principles. As the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that the Muslims are like one body. And if one body feels pain, then everyone rushes to see to it that they take care. So we Muslims should be like one body, parts of different body, and we should help each other. And as the Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 2, that help one another in birr and taqwa, in righteousness and in good deeds, in virtue. We Muslims should stand up together and internationally, if all the Muslims get together and object to the injustice that's being done in Sri Lanka against the minorities, against the Muslims and against the Christian, then inshallah there are high chances that the Sri Lankan government would change the law. Because there is no scientific evidence at all what they are saying that because the health authorities are saying that the reason they want to burn the bodies of all the COVID-19 people who have been tested positive. And but natural in Islam and Christianity, it is against our faith to burn a body. In Islam and Christianity, a body after death should be buried. And we hope that even the Christian countries all over the world, they unite together and they take, they take action or they put pressure on Sri Lanka to change this unjustified law. Another thing that can be done is that we should, we, we Muslims should use the social media to make this thing known throughout the world. And inshallah, very shortly, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, I myself would be leaving and post, Facebook post, because my daughter, she had exams. My, my youngest daughter, Rujda, she's very good with the pen. So I'll, most of the time I tell her to draft post on such issues. So she just finished her examination of the second last year where she is studying Islamic studies in bachelors. So inshallah, in the next couple of days, you'll find a series of posts talking about this issue so that there is more awareness in the Muslim Ummah. And I request the Muslim all over the world that to see to it that they make it aware to the people all across the world the injustice that has been done by the Sri Lankan government so that the people as <clears throat> as if the muslims get together and they make it aware so inshallah we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may the sri lankan government change the unjustified stance and allow the people who have died because of covid-19 to choose whether they want to be buried or whether they want to be cremated <coughs> the next question is from Fazle Rabbi from Bangladesh. The trending problem in Bangladesh now 
is about the making of a sculpture or statue what is the direction for this in the quran and sunnah most of the people aren't clear about this people are quarreling by saying that worshiping any statue is different from making a statue of a person who did good deeds they are saying that most of the muslim countries have human sculptures so there is no problem with making some in our country on the other hand some muslim some islamic minded groups are saying that all the sculptures should be broken and they won't let anyone make any new sculpture would you please clarify the situation thank you in advance may allah bless you <coughs> as far as making statues or sculptures it's clearly mentioned in sahih bukhari volume number 7 hadith number 5963 that a beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that anyone who makes images in this world allah will ask him to put life to that image on the day of resurrection and he will not be able to do it The same hadith is repeated in Sahih Muslim, volume number five, hadith number five five four one, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if anyone makes images, such as statues, sculptures, drawing, painting, in this world, Allah will ask him to put soul on the day of resurrection, and he will not be able to do it. This answer, whether to make images, statues, sculptures. drawing painting has been dealt with me in detail in the earlier answer and there are several hadith in bukhari muslim and various sahih hadith i will not go into details because the answer become very long but in short in islam it is prohibited for anyone to make images whether painting whether drawing whether sculpture whether it be statues of animate things or of living creatures from the animal kingdom whether they be human beings whether they be animals birds insects fish etc all these are prohibited and there are various evidence which we won't go into the detail now coming to this question what's happened in bangladesh that the government had decided to make a statue of a person who is very famous and had supposed to be done by the government has done good work so that the reason they want to revere him and respect him and build a statue and now the community is divided some who are more secular minded are saying that it is okay we aren't worshiping the statue just because it is good deed they are just revering and and out of respect we are making it and the other group is saying islamically it's prohibited to make a statue of human beings or of animals or birds etc and the statue should be broken but natural the first group of people are not following the rules of the quran and sunnah and as i mentioned earlier that there are various hadith in bukhari and muslim which prohibits a muslim to make a statue of a human being or an animal or of a bird of insect etc so based on this the second group of muslim in bangladesh are more correct and regarding should it be broken the idols there are various hadiths and we know that prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he returned to makkah after fath makkah the first thing he did was he went to kaaba and there were about 360 idols in kaaba and he went into it and he broke the idols reciting the verse of the quran of surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 81 where he recited and he said wa qul ja al haqq wa zaq al batil inna al batil qana zawka when truth is heard again falsehood falsehood perishes for falsehood is by its nature bound to perish so the prophet recited the verse of the quran of surah isra chapter 17 verse number 81 and broke the idols and in a islamic country where the islamic law has to be followed this is the ruling that a statue or a idol of human beings or of animals or of birds etc cannot be made and if it is there the islamic ruling is 
that it should be broken and that's what the Prophet had told the Sahaba and there are various hadith in Bukhari, in Muslim where the Sahaba have been instructed by the Prophet to break the statue and even according to the fatwa of Ibn Taymiyyah Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah says that the statue should be broken especially if they fall in the two categories if it's of a deceased person of a person who has died or if the statue is put on the grave it should be broken so I do agree with the second group that Islamically it's not correct to make statue of anyone if you have to make of people who you think are good then but natural there's no one better than the Prophet and but natural making an image or a statue of Prophet is prohibited then will come the Khulfa Rashidin, then will come the Sabahs and you never find anywhere in the Islamic world any statue has been made of the Prophet or the Khulfa Rashidin or of the Sabahs so this is totally un-Islamic and this thing should not happen and uh, my advice would be that they should not do it they should not make statue of any living creature any living human being even if he was a person who has to be respected but making statue in Islam is haram and I do agree with the second group this should not happen and if it's there these, these statues should be broken hope that answers the question We have on the Facebook Muslim Pukhtun Muhammad Saifullah Saleh Wahid Qadir Jobed Kabir Shetu Love and respect for you sir May Allah protect you and bless you May Allah bless you too Inzaman Sarovar Muhammad Bashir Sudesh Rahman Salam from Pakistan Abdul Kalam I love you sir I love you too Afrun Nabeen Sam But May Allah save you from the enemies Ameen Ali Al Qawlani Faiza Shahzad Muhammad Amit Hassan Muhammad Munir Zaman Razia Sahi Anayat Loan Huma Malik Muhammad Rustam Nuri Abdu Muhammad Uzair Diri Gali Klawab Karab Love you Dr. Zakir I love you too Muhammad Nasir Munira Aliyu Abba Toro Patient Ika Mr. Roni Thank you so much sir Love you I love you too That were the people on the Facebook People on the YouTube Muhammad Arnas, peace be on you, peace be on you too. Kaif Laheja, Ahad Khan, Hamad Yadgir, Elit Gamers, Bulbul Mahmood, Stephen Ralte, Sharon Alam, Nahid Hassan, Muhammad Arnas, Amir Alawi, Kaif Laheja, Samir Al, Muhammad Ajmal Jasim Zaheer Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam Jazakallah for Jazakallah for all your duas and may Allah bless you all too The next question, I am Umar Farooq from Kurnool district, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am a student pursuing my graduation and simultaneously preparing for civil services examination. What does Islam say about euthanasia 
that is ending life to relieve pain and suffering and what's your view on it is it allowed in islam or not Ethanuza by definition means putting an end to a life of a person to stop his suffering or to stop the pain. It is also called as mercy killing. <coughs> there are very different types and categories of Ethanuza. As a whole, almost all types of Ethanuza are prohibited killing anyone just to prevent him from suffering or prevent him from, from pain. It is prohibited. Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves a human being, it is as though he has saved the whole nation. So based on this verse of the Quran, Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 32, killing anyone, murdering anyone for any reason, unless it is, if he has killed someone or he has caused corruption in the land, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And murdering someone is the second major sin in Islam. So according to all the fuqahas, all the scholars, mercy killing almost all the different types. I'll come to the exception later. Almost all the different types, they are prohibited. The euthanasia can be broadly classified into two types. One is active euthanasia, one is passive euthanasia. In active euthanasia, maybe a drug is injected in the body or some tablets are given so that the patient dies. In passive euthanasia, no drug is injected, nothing is given, only the equipment which is life supporting equipment, it is withdrawn and the person dies. As far as active euthanasia is concerned, there are various different types. You have the direct euthanasia. Direct euthanasia can, uh, can further be classified into three types. One is where the patient himself tells that he's suffering and he is conscious and he is in pain and he wants to end his life and he requests the doctor or someone else that his life should be ended. That is called as the individual person himself saying direct. Second type is that the patient himself may not be very sane, may not be aware. So the relatives of the, of the patient tells the doctor that please end the life to end the suffering. A third type may be that the doctor themselves advise that the patient should be put to death, should be put to death so that the suffering ends and they inject a drug, etc., so that the patient dies. All these types of direct ethanols are haram and it is prohibited. No human being has the right to take the life of any other human being unless I give exception, unless he has committed murder or unless it's in the battlefield or unless he's caught in corruption, but just because to save him from the suffering, it is not permitted. Number two, the second type can be assisted suicide, where the patient himself wants to end his life or he is advised by someone else how to end his life. This is called assisted suicide and suicide is prohibited in Islam. And there are various hadith in which the Prophet said that a person who commits suicide, he will be in hellfire. The Prophet also says that if a person stabs himself with a dagger, then he will be put to hellfire and he'll keep on stabbing himself till the end. And there are various hadith. So this will come under suicide and it is prohibited. The other type is indirect, where the doctor is, is indirect euthanasia, where a doctor may increase the dose of painkillers or some medicine so that the patient dies. This itself is also prohibited. It is nothing but murder. It's haram in Islam. The other type of euthanasia, which I mentioned, is passive euthanasia. Passive euthanasia means actively the patient is not killed, but the patient is on equipment 
on life saving equipment, maybe ventilators, maybe fibrillators, and if this is taken away, the patient will die. So these equipment is taken away or maybe the treatment is stopped and the patient dies. As far as passive euthanasia is concerned, most of the passive euthanasia is also haram. We cannot voluntarily, purposely stop the treatment to kill the patient. We should try a level best, keep on treating the patient till he dies on his own. You cannot actively stop the treatment or take out the life supporting equipment unless under one condition. According to the Islamic Fiqh Council of OIC, Organization of Islamic Corporation, they had a conference and they decided that unless it is known that the Muslim or the person is dead, that's the only time you can remove the life-saving equipment. And there are two ways, this council said, that can be identified that the person is dead. Number one, that the, we can identify that the person is dead. Number one is that if the person, his breathing stops completely and his heart stops and it is irreversible. So if the heartbeat completely stops, it's irreversible and the breathing stops, it's irreversible. Uh, it is irreversible and this is testified by the doctor then and especially the Islamic Fiqh Council says it should be three doctors, three specialists. Then the patient can be claimed to be dead or if the patient has brain death. Brain death means the brain has stopped functioning. So if there are at least three specialists who have testified that all the functions in the brain of that patient have ceased and necrosis of the brain has started and yet the heart is beating only because he is kept on the ventilators and the supporting equipment in this condition and the doctor says it's irreversible brain death and the functions can never return and if three doctors certified in this case only can the life-saving equipment be removed. So if the patient is brain dead and yet his heart is beating, he is breathing because of the supporting equipment like ventilators etc. These can be removed if it is certified by three specialist doctors that it is an irreversible brain death. In this condition, this will also be called as one type of passive euthanasia. So this is the only condition where passive euthanasia is permitted when the patient is certified as dead or as brain death. And no other condition just to stop his suffering or to stop his pain can euthanasia be done. It's only this condition where the brain death is done and when three specialists say it's irreversible, that's the only time passive euthanasia or passive mercy killing can be done. The next question, <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum, my name is Shafiq Wahdi, I am from England, I am of Afghan origin. Is it permissible to deliver non-Zabiha meat like chicken etc only to deliver not to eat as a delivery driver? This question is very important for many brothers in England. The question posed by Brother Shafiq from England, from UK, is that is it permissible for a Muslim to deliver non zabiya meat? He's not going to eat it, he knows eating is haram, but can we deliver it? Allah SWT says in the Glorious Quran, in no less than four different places, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 173, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 145, 
and Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 115 Hurrimat alaykumul maytutu wa damu wa lahmul khanzeer wa ma uhilla li gair illa bi Forbidden for you for food are dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is invoked So from these four verses in the Quran it's absolutely clear that dead meat is prohibited Furthermore there are various verses in the Quran including Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 118 that eat not of the meat on which Allah's name is not pronounced and based on this it is very clear that eating non zabiha meat if it is not slaughtered according to, according to the Islamic principles according to the Sharia that meat is haram now the question is that is it permissible to deliver such type of meat which is haram for Muslims to eat but can we deliver to non-Muslim? Is it permitted? And can we do a job of a delivery man in which food is haram? The food to eat is haram for the Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 2, that help one another in bir and taqwa, in righteousness and in good deeds. And the verse continues, but do not help one another in sin and transgression. So, if eating non zabiya meat, whether it be chicken, whether it be mutton, whether it be beef, is haram, then you delivering the meat to someone else, that means you are assisting them in haram. So, based on this, even delivering haram food, whether it be pork, whether it be alcohol, whether it be non zabiya meat, is prohibited. And Sheikh al-Islam Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah when he was asked this question is it permitted to transport or sell haram food he said it's against the Sharia selling or transporting haram food is prohibited as Allah says in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 2 that do not help one another in sin and transgression and furthermore there are examples given regarding haram food. It's mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number 4, in the book of intoxication, hadith number 3381, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses 10 categories of people who involve themselves with alcohol. The one who distills it, the one for whom it is distilled, the one for whom it is brought, for one whom, for whom it is transported, the one who drinks it, the one who serves it, the one who sells it, the one who utilizes the money of the sale, the one who buys it, the one who buys it for someone else. All these 10 categories of people are cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So based on this, when alcohol is prohibited, all 10 categories are prohibited, uh, all 10 categories are prohibited. This means even for the haram food, whether it be pork, whether it be non zabia meat, all these categories, whether you transport it, whether you sell it, whether you utilize the money from its sales, all are haram. So for a Muslim to work as a delivery person or a delivery driver in food which are haram, it is prohibited. Even if it's mixed, some haram and some halal, it is prohibited. And the person should change his job and see to it that he does not do it because it is helping one another in sin and transgression. Hope that answers the question. Next question. Abdul Jabbar, I am an IT professional from Chicago, USA. Is it permissible for a Muslim who is learning martial arts for self-defense to bow to one another, which is a requirement in most martial arts? There is a question. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Name, Sumaya. Profession, software engineer. City, 
Miyazaki, country Japan. The question, Japanese people bow to each other to show respect. Since Muslim only do ruku and sajda for Allah alone, will it be wrong to bow to a human being, even if it is not being done as a form of worship? I try my best to not bow and limit the movement to a slight nod, since it seems a little impolite to stand stiff when the other is showing you respect. I would love to hear your perspective on this matter. Jazakallah khair. The question poses that is it allowed to bow down if you are learning self-defense, martial arts, whether it be judo, taekwondo, whether it be karate, in which almost all these martial arts you bow down. Some bow down to great extent equal to ruku, some do sajda also and some do little bowing. Is it permissible? And similarly, is it permissible to greet someone and while greeting, can you bow? It's clearly mentioned in Hadith of Sunan at tirmidhi volume number 5, Hadith number 2728, where Anas bin Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that a man approaches the Messenger of Allah and says that when we meet our brother or meet our friends, should we bow down to each other? The Prophet said no. Should we hug one another and kiss one another? The Prophet said no. Should we take the hand and shake hands? The Prophet said yes. A similar hadith is mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number 5, hadith number 3702, that Anas bin Allah. Anas bin Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, he says that a man approaches the messenger of Allah and says that can we bow to one another and the Prophet said no. Can we hug or kiss one another, the Prophet said no. You should shake hands. And both these hadith are say according to Nasrud al-Bani, Sheikh Nasrud al-Bani says that both these hadith are Hassan. And he mentions it in his Silsila Isai. And according to Imam Tirmidhi also, the hadith of Tirmidhi is Hassan. Based on this hadith, most of the scholars, almost all the scholars generally agree that if you are doing bowing equivalent to the ruku which you do in Salah, or you are doing sajda like how you do in Salah, almost all the scholars unanimously agree almost all, not 100%, that this is prohibited. There are some scholars who say that if you bow to the level of ruku which is done in sajda, it is prohibited. But if you bow to a lesser extent, maybe 50% or 25%, and your niya is not worship, it is makru. This is said by Sheikh Na Nasir al Awad. Oh. Sheikh Nasir al Umar, he says that if you do not bow to the level of what you bow in your salah, and if you do ruku less than that, 50%, 25%, and your niya is not to worship, then it is makru. There are some scholars in the Western world, including the European Council of Fatwa, they say that for martial arts, for learning of self-defense, if you are bowing, as long as your intention is not worship, it is permissible. But, as I told you, the majority of the scholars, they are of the opinion that even if you bow less, 50% or less, irrespective of the niya is worship or not, it is haram. And according to Sheikh Ibn Qayyum, may Allah be pleased with him, that may Allah have mercy on him, he says that bowing in any form, whether 
as we do in Salah or less than that, whether in the form of worship, whether in the form of respect, bowing to any other human being is haram. And even the standing committee of fatwa in Saudi Arabia, they have given the fatwa that bowing in any form, even less than the ruku, whether it's for worship or whether it's for respect, whether it's been self-defense, it is prohibited. This question was asked even to Sheikh bin Baz. May Allah have mercy on him. That is bowing permitted in greeting like the Japanese do or is it permitted while doing martial art? He said bowing in any form, whether for greeting or whether for martial art, it is prohibited and should not be done. And I do agree with this majority call, the majority of the scholars. I do believe in the fatwa of, of no. Sheikh Ibn Al-Qayyum and Sheikh Bin Baz that bowing in any form, whether same as Ruku or whether less, whether it is for respect, whether it's for worship, all these forms, whether it be greeting, I feel it should not be done and it is not permitted in Islam. We have uh, on the Facebook, Muhammad Nasser, Munira Aliyu, Abba Toro, Naushan Khan, M.F. Roni, thank you so much, sir. I love you, I love you too. Vasayon Donze, Assalamu alaikum, doctor, wa alaikum salam. Muhammad Noor Nabi, Assalamu alaikum, sir, wa alaikum salam. We are waiting eagerly for Peace TV Bangla in Bangladesh. What will we do to see it? If you want to see Peace TV in Bangladesh, you can download the app of Peace TV Network from the App Store or from the Google Play, whether you have an iPhone or whether you have Android, and you can watch it live on your app. Or you can take, put a private dish, buy a private dish with hardly cost about 10,000 takas. And you can watch it, you can watch all the four channels, Peace TV English, Urdu, Bangla, and Chinese. Abdullah Sheikh, thank you very much. Sam Butt, Hilal Ansari, Prince Oni, Ima Jihad Abdu, Furaj Ali, Bilal Hussain. That was on the Facebook. We have on the YouTube Aryan Hussain, Arafat Hussain. Ahmad Kazemi, Patriot, Murad Khan, Muhammad Mustafa Hassan, Adil Nafar, Fahim Abrar, Sheikh Shaukat Zamil, Asif Ali, Next question, Ariz Ali from Jhasi, India, student of class 12, were previous prophets Muslims or Jews? But the Ariz has asked that, were the previous prophets Muslims or Jews? Prophets are messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God, 
Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in Naddina in the Lai Islam, the only religion acceptable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by Almighty God, is Islam. Allah repeats this message in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 85, that if anyone desires any other religion, it will never be accepted of him. And in the year after, he will be amongst the losers. So we know very well that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down only one religion and that is Islam. That is submitting a will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if Allah Almighty God has sent down only one religion, so but natural, all the prophets of God should follow that religion. Muslim is the person who submits his will to Almighty God. So all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who preached Islam, they were Muslims. They submitted the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they and the Quran mentions that there were 20, the Quran mentions 25 prophets by name who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down. And Quran clearly says in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 54, that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was a Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 67, that Abraham alayhi salam was not a Jew or a Christian, but he was a Muslim. So, but natural, all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, it's mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down 124,000 messengers on the face of this earth. All the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all the prophets of God, they were Muslims, that means they submitted, to will, they submitted their will to Almighty God, by name, 25 are mentioned in the Quran, and all of these prophets also were Muslims. The next question, my name is Kaisar Raza, I am from India. One of my friends who buys and sells cars asked me to invest 10 lakh rupees in his business. He is a pious Muslim. I asked him how much profit he will provide me and he said on an average rupees 26,000. But in case if there is no business sometimes he will provide me 13 or 14,000. But mostly he will give me an average of 26,000 rupees per month. I want to know is it halal or haram? I am very confused. And in this lockdown, I lost my job as well. So I am really in need of this profit right now. But if you suggest it is haram, I will take my money back. While doing business, a Muslim should look for few things to identify whether the business is haram or halal. One of the things is to check whether the core activity of that business is haram or halal. And we know that selling and buying of cars, it is perfectly halal. Buying and selling of cars, buying a car and you add some profit and sell it, it is perfectly permitted. The thing should be noticed or should be taken care of is that while buying and selling of cars you should not take money from the bank that will be riba. You should not involve a conventional bank in the buying or selling. If you involve a conventional bank in buying or selling of the car that becomes riba based and it is haram. And I am sure that since he's taken money from you so he will not be involving any conventional bank. So if he buys and sells cars and doesn't involve conventional bank in it, it is permitted. The third factor to be noted is that there should not be any other haram things involved. While buying and selling of cars, he should not tell lies, he should not cheat, he should be honest, he should tell the fact. He cannot, while buying and selling of cars, but naturally they may be used cars. While doing that, he should not cheat the person, he should not hide the defects of the car. These things would be not permitted. He should be honest and just and if he in involves himself in buying and selling of cars, doesn't involve himself with a conventional bank, doesn't involve in riba, and he sees to it that he is honest and he is truthful and doesn't involve in any of the haram activity, then the business becomes halal. So this business per se where you have invested, if all what I said is applicable, then the business is halal. 
Now coming to the main question that he is giving he is giving you a rough estimate on how much will you make profit and that is permitted. But he cannot say that every month I will give you a fixed amount. You give 10 lakh rupees and every month if I give you a fixed amount of 26,000 rupees then that becomes zirba. He cannot give you a fixed amount every month on the amount you have invested. He can tell you the approximate amount you will get and better would be and he rightly said that if he makes if he business doesn't go well he will give you less profit that's perfectly fine that's how business is done but better would be that if you write all this down in a contract as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 282 that put it down in writing and take two men as witness amongst yourself in this writing if you mention the percentage of profit as fixed that would be better that means since he's taken 10 lakh rupees from you and he is the one who is taking all the pains and and buying and selling you have only put your money so there should be a profit sharing he can say that since you have put the money and i am doing the major work let's share 50 50 or he may say i will give you 60 percent i'll take 40 percent or he may say i will give you 70 percent i'll take 30 percent this if it's preferable it should be written down in writing now whatever we profit that is earned by the money invested by you so much percentage of profit will go to you and the balance will come to me because I am managing the business this is the best rather than leaving it haphazard and keeping on changing uh, the percentage you can keep a fixed percentage of profit the amount will keep on fluctuating but the amount cannot be fixed the percentage of profit can be fixed the amount will keep on fluctuating because he may make a profit of some time 50,000 rupees. If he says 50 50, then both will get 25%. If he says 60 40, you will get 30,000, he'll get 20,000. So the percentage can be fixed, but the amount will keep on fluctuating. So if all these things are taken care, then the business is halal, you can continue with it, but preferably you write it down so that there is no dispute in future, as Allah says in the Quran, sorry, Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 282. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Zakir Naik, my name is Umar Farik. I was wondering whether buying something on installment is halal in Islam. For example, if I want to buy a car that cost 100,000, I can choose to pay 100% by cash or I can choose to pay by installment. If I pay by installment, I may end up paying $120,000 or more. So is the $20,000 riba? A similar question is asked by Jamshed Khan from Peshawar, Pakistan. What is your opinion on the basis of the Quran and Sunnah about any car, motorcycle, or house that a person sells on installments with greater price and if you want to buy hand in hand then its price is less. I am talking about bank, I am not, I'm not talking about bank but any businessman doing this business, he is selling electronic appliances following the installments with greater price. <clears throat> uh, 
as far as the question is concerned whether can a person buy goods whether it be car motorcycle house etc in installments and if the cost is hundred dollar or hundred thousand dollars while paying an installment he may pay installment monthly installment or quarterly installment for a period of one year or two years or three years and if he charges extra when he pays installment is this permissible or is this rabba as far as paying on installments is concerned there are various hadith which permits in paying installment there's a hadith mentioned in Sahih Bukhari volume number three hadith number 2068 Hadith Aisha may Allah be pleased with her she said that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he brought he bought food from a Jew and said he will pay later and he kept his shield as a guarantee that means Prophet Muhammad he bought food from a Jew and he said he will pay later and he kept his shield as a guarantee that means paying later is permitted in Islam further is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari point number 3 hadith number 2168 that Aisha may Allah be pleased with her she said that Barira came to her and said that she wants to draft a contract of her manumission saying that she will pay nine vakiha that means nine gold so that she will get freed and she will pay one vakiha one gold coin every year that means she drafted a contract that for her freedom she will pay the master nine vakiha that is nine gold coins and one every year and the prophet permitted that so based on this there is no doubt that paying in installment is permitted there is no direct evidence in the Quran or the Sunnah that can you increase your price when you pay an installment because of this there is one group of scholar who says that when you pay an installment no problem but if you increase the price in installment it is Rabah and they quote the verse of the Quran of Surah Bakra chapter 2 verse number 275 which says that they say that riba is like trade so tell them trade is permitted riba is prohibited so these scholars say that see because they're taking extra amount of money after when you're paying installment it is riba it is additional it is haram however the other group of scholars they say and the majority of the scholars they say that paying an installment and increasing the amount when you are paying an installment it is permitted most of the fuqahas of the Hanafi school of thought and the Maliki school of thought and the Shafi school of thought and the Hanbali school of thought all four they say that paying extra amount in installment is permitted it is part of trade and they quote the same verse of the Quran of Surah Bakra chapter number 2 verse number 275 and they say that they say that riba is like trade trade is permitted and riba is prohibited what they are saying that the argument that increasing the price makes it riba is totally wrong because in trading you buy and you increase the cost normally also you buy and you take an extra profit as long as the amount is fixed it is permitted so if you say that I am giving you a cash discount if you pay on the spot and if this will cost you hundred dollars but if you're paying an installment monthly installment at the end of the year you pay hundred and ten dollars that is permitted if the amount is fixed and the installment is fixed it is permitted but if the amount increases if you delay the payment then that is riba. so if you pay an installment and if you delay in payment and if they say that if you delay in payment is the installment then this is haram this involves riba but just by saying that if you buy on the spot you pay hundred dollars if you pay an installment 
and every month you pay $110 at the end of the year, it is permitted, it is not riba. And they further quote the verse of the Quran of Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 29, which says that do not, do not spend amongst yourselves on vanities. But rather, amongst yourself, you do trade and traffic based on the guidelines. That means, based on the verse of the Quran, you can do trade and you can traffic based on the guidelines. And they say that Allah clearly mentions in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 282, that whenever there is a future contract, between two parties, put it down in writing and take amongst yourself two men as witnesses. This is the longest verse of the Quran of Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 282. And when Sheikh bin Baz was asked this question, that is it permitted to buy an installment, he said yes, if it's fixed price, the price is X amount, if you pay an installment, you pay more, if it's fixed amount, fixed time, it is permitted. Those who say it is not permitted, they are wrong. And he gives the example from Hadith of Bahaki that the Prophet, peace be upon him, he told the Sahabas that buy the camel for the war. So the Sahabas, they go out and they buy a camel saying that we will give you two camels later. That means they are buying one camel and they say we will give you two camels later. That means it is permitted. Same as long as there is a contract and if both the parties agree, the buyer and the seller, if they agree and if it's a contract based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 282, it is permitted. So between these, there's a small group of scholars which say, if you pay an installment and you increase the amount, that is riba. But the bigger group and majority of the four schools of thought, they say that it is permitted as long as it is written down in contract. It's a fixed amount and if there's a delay in payment, there should not be an increase in the payment. If this condition is kept, then buying and selling an installment and giving extra amount is permitted and it is allowed by Islam. The next question, <clears throat> I am Hanna, ACCA student from India. Can I work in an auditing company as external auditor or tax analyst like the big four who is not directly involved in recording riba but have to check the accounts including that of riba whether they are in accordance with the standards of financial reporting. Are such jobs equivalent to those of recording or witnessing riba transactions? I have one more doubt. Can you explain the jobs that are haram in finance? As it seems most of them are haram as in India, most of the companies get interest to run business. Is it better for me to change my career to some other field? The question posed is that is it permissible for a Muslim to work in companies which are auditing companies like the big four? Though they may not be directly involved in riba or in interest, but they may be doing the accounting and the auditing of companies which may be dealing in riba. As far as working in auditing companies which audit other companies 
and they may be involving in riba is it permissible yes it's permissible as a general rule because the core activity of that auditing company is to audit it is not to deal in riba what is prohibited is working in a company which is dealing in riba most for example you cannot work in a conventional bank on any post whether as a clerk whether as an accountant whether as an auditor because the core activity of that company the bank is riba based or working in a financial institution which is giving or taking interest it is haram or working as an auditor in a company which core activity is haram like an alcoholic company it's haram or working in a company which is mainly producing pork items it's haram so working as an auditor in a company which is doing major activity as haram that is haram not only as, as an auditor it's haram to work as a clerk it is haram to work as a sweeper it is haram to work as a manager if the main activity of the company is haram but here you are working for an auditing company if that auditing company is doing audition of a company which is giving and taking riba but if the riba that they are taking and giving is not the core activity it becomes permissible we are aware that most of the companies throughout the world they take loan from the bank but if the loan amount is a small amount or less than one third then that doesn't become the core activity it's permitted for you to do auditing on that company if if your auditing firm gets a client who are owning alcohol companies then there may be a problem so what you can do that such companies in percentage would be very less so you can always request the owner or the ceo of that auditing firm that please do not give me companies which are selling alcohol to audit don't give me auditing of those companies in which major activities are haram like maybe gambling or or maybe an alcoholic company or a conventional bank if this you request it's possible because most of the companies are not these companies these companies which are haram are very small percentage so see to it that you do not get involved in auditing the companies with major activities haram but if it's the other companies which are giving and taking interest on a smaller level it's permitted think that your income is coming from the halal part of it so you need not change your job you can very well continue being an auditor or being a ca in the finance field but just take care that directly do not work in alcoholic companies or companies which are involved in gambling or in haram activities you can surely join other companies if you are joining auditing firm company you are well you are most welcome to audit all the types of company except those company which are involving in haram activity directly hope that answers the question the next question <coughs> from asif anwar ahmed malda west bengal india how can i get your appointment i would like to meet you as far as the question is concerned if someone wants to meet me meeting me is alhamdulillah very easy very simple and most of the people are aware that i normally pray my juma sala always in the putra mosque i'm staying in putrajaya which is the administrative capital of malaysia and most of the people know that i'm staying here and whenever i'm in putrajaya most of the time i'm there in putrajaya rarely i travel and especially now where the traveling is restricted so as long as i'm not traveling whenever i'm in putrajaya i pray in putra mosque and alhamdulillah every friday there are hundreds of people coming to meet me so after juma salah 
I normally pray in the second or third row, just behind the Imam. And after I finish my Salah, after praying the Sunnah, there are hundreds of people there to meet me and it's very easy for you to meet me, to shake my hands, most of them take photographs, no problem at all. And I stay for about a few minutes meeting the few hundred people, so each person takes about a few seconds. So meeting me, per se, shaking hand, removing photograph is very easy. If you want to meet for a little bit longer, people know that I stay in Putrajaya, I stay in present 8 and getting my address is very easy. You can go to Putra Mosque, Putrajaya Mosque, Putra Mosque and ask and you get it. And in the complex where I stay, there is a Surau or a local mosque where I normally pray five times Salah. After any of the Salah, anyone comes to meet, I meet, but, but natural, I spend approximately one minute with the person. I cannot spend long. So surely, how are you? You can exchange greetings, Salam, Walaikum Salam, shake hands, want to take out a photograph, no problem, want to take autograph, no problem. Maybe if you speak to my assistant, maybe I may spend two minutes with you. So meeting me is very easy. Anyone, whether he's a friend of mine or not a friend of mine, whether he's a fan of mine or not a fan, whether he's a Muslim or non-Muslim, it is very easy to meet me. More people come to the Putra Mosque where I meet a few hundred people. Otherwise, normally other Salah five times a day also, there is someone or the other always there to meet me. But I normally spend one minute. If it's informed to my secretary, maybe I spend two minutes, not more than that. I want to cover more people in lesser time. So on Fridays, in few minutes, I cover a few hundred people. Other normal five times Salah, in a few minutes, I cover a few people. If you want an appointment to meet and discuss, that becomes difficult. If you want to spend half an hour or one hour, it's difficult because there are thousands of people who want to meet and I'm only one person. I would love to meet each and every one. I would love. But because of time constraint, because of my commitments, meeting me is very easy. But if you want to spend time and chat for a longer time, half an hour, etc., it's extremely difficult. For that, you'll have to meet my assistant. You'll have to say why you want to meet, what is the requirement, etc. And if you feel that you're going to cause a major benefit to the Ummah, and because if I spend maybe 20 minutes, half an hour with anyone, I'm stopping my other Dawa activity. So there's a decision taken uh, by my secretary that if the activity where he wants to meet is a major benefit for the Ummah, and if I have to spend time and stop my other Dawa activity, he may give an appointment. Otherwise, it's difficult. But to meet me, and to say salams to me is very easy, shake my hands is very easy, want to take a photograph, very easy, because, and this is the case with any practicing Muslim who goes to the mosque, it's very easy, you should try and find out which mosque he goes to pray, whether it be the Juma Salah or whether it be the five times Salah, it's very easy to catch a practicing Muslim in the mosque and at least meet him for a few seconds. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Zakir Naik, sir. My name is Mayuri Paul. I am from West Bengal, India. Now I live in Katlia Haura. I have read the translation of the whole Quran. I want to know more about Islam. Please suggest me some Islamic books names. If I read the books, I will be able to know more about Islam and Muslims much better. Sister Mayuri Paul has asked a question that she has read the translation of the Quran. She wants to understand Islam and Muslims better. So she asked me the question, which books should she read? But naturally, the translation of the Quran is the best. And read it as often as you can, even if you read 100 times, it is less. Reading the translation of the Quran is the best. One of the good translations in English that is available is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. If you can read the revised edition, the translation 
of the glorious Quran by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. That's one of the good translation. The other good translation also is by Sai International. That's another good translation. After the translation of the Quran, the next book that I would that I would like to recommend to you, it is the biography of the Prophet. The title of the book is Sealed Nectar or Rahikal Maktoum. This book is written by Sheikh Safiur Rahman Mubarak Puri and he got an award when a competition took place in the Muslim World League, the Rapta Alam Islamia, and where many people presented the Seerah of the Prophet. This book, Alhamdulillah, got the first award. So this book is a very good book. It's mainly based on Quran and Sahih Hadith. The information is correct. It talks about the biography, the life history of the Prophet. This book I recommend to you to read next. After that, you can read the books which I have written. One of the very important books for non-Muslims to read is Most Common Question Asked by Non-Muslims or Misconception About Islam. This book is available in the market. You can even go on my website, zakirnaik.com. It's available. This will give you the replies to the common questions. You can read the book on similarities between Islam and Christianity or similarities between Islam and Hinduism. It will enlighten you about the similarities about these religions. You can read my book on concept of God in major world religions. We talk about Tawheed, the oneness of God. The most important factor in Islam it is Tawheed. It is believing and worshipping only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can read my book on Prophet Muhammad prophesied in the major world religions, in the major world religious scriptures. That's a very good book which will talk about the prophecy about Prophet Muhammad in the various scriptures of the world religion. Next, you can read my book on Quran and modern science. It will show you how compatible Islam is with science. You can read my book on women's rights in Islam. That will give you a good knowledge about the rights that women get in Islam. And there are various other books. You need not purchase these books. You can go to my website zakirnaik.com and download the books or read it. And there are various other material on the website. So my advice to you would be that you can go to the website and go to the section, different religions are there, different topics are there. You can also watch Peace TV. You, if you are, depending on the country you are staying, you can buy a private dish. It's approximately 8 feet in size. It costs about 150 US dollars in most parts of the world. Put it on your roof and watch it absolutely free. Or you can download the app from the App Store if you have an Apple phone, iPhone, or from the Google Play Store if you have an Android, Samsung, etc. This is an app. Download it absolutely free. And you can see all the four satellite channels of Peach TV Peach TV English, Peach TV Urdu, Peach TV Bangla, and Peach TV Chinese. This will give you a lot of information about Islam. And inshallah, we'll get you closer to Islam. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He give you guidance and may He give you hidayah to follow the right deen, to choose the right religion and implement on it. The time is running short. We'll just take one last question before we end the session. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik. I am Naweed Ahmed from Adelaide, from Australia, originally from Bangladesh. Is it obligatory to give dawa if someone is reciting in a non-Muslim country? Dawa is compulsory on every Muslim. It's compulsory that every Muslim conveys the message of Islam to those who are unaware of it. And especially if you are living in a non-Muslim country, it becomes double farz, more farz on you to convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. Whether a Muslim living in a non-Muslim country, that's the different answer. You can refer to that audio. <laughs> you can refer to the answer. Type on the YouTube, you'll get the reply. But 
if you are living in a non-Muslim country, doing dawa is more important than otherwise. There are various Quranic verses I have given a talk on this and time will not permit me to speak in detail. I will just quote a few verses of the Quran. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Imran chapter number 3 verse, verse number 110. Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Ta'miruna bil ma'roofi wa tanhawna il murkar. Because you enjoy what is good and you forbid what is wrong and you believe in Allah. What's minuna billah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse of the Quran in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 110 is saying that ye Muslims, ye are the best of people they all for mankind. And the reason he calls us the best is because we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we aren't fit to be called as khaira ummah. We aren't fit to be called as Muslims. So doing dawa is compulsory on every Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal ma'azat al hasna wajad al bilati ahsan. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. So in doing dawa is fard in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Wal Asr, in al insan al fikhus. By the token of time, Allah is taking an oath of time. Man is verily in khasara, man is in loss, unless those who have faith. Wal Asr, in the insan al fikhus, illa ladin amanu, mu amilu salihati, wa ta wasa bil haqqa ta wasa bil sabr. Except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to patience and perseverance, and those who those who invite people to the truth and those who invite people to patience and perseverance. So here in Surah Al-Asr, it is called as Rahe Nijad, the path for salvation. For any human being to enter Jannah, minimum four criteria are required. Number one, that he should have a righteous deed. Illa ladin amanu, he should have iman. Number one is that that human being should have imam. Il should have iman, should have faith. Wal asr. Innal insan la fi khus. Illa ladina amanu. Wa amilu salihati. Here the Quran says in Surah Al Asr that man is very little lost except if he has faith. If he has righteous deed. Illa ladina amanu. Wa amilu salihati. Wa tawasaw bil haqq, tawasaw bil sabr. And those who invite people to the haqq, to the truth. And those who invite people to patience and perseverance. So for any human being to enter Jannah, he requires minimum four criteria. Number one is he should have Iman. Number two, he should have righteous deed. Number three, he should invite people to truth, that is Dawa and Islam. And number four, he should invite people for patience and perseverance. So one of the criteria to enter Jannah is Dawa, is inviting people to Islam. You may be a very good Muslim, you may be praying five times a day, you may be fasting in the month of Ramadan, you may have gone for Hajj. But if you do not do Dawah under normal circumstances, according to Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, you shall not enter Jannah. To enter Jannah, minimum four criteria is required. Iman, righteous deed, Dawah, inviting people to truth, inviting people to patience and perseverance. So, if you are living in a non-Muslim country, all the more reason, dawah becomes fard. It is compulsory for any human being to enter Jannah. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 104, let there arise out of you a band of people that enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. <coughs> These are the ones who shall attain felicity. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about full-time da'is, full-time du'ats. Let the arise out of you a band of people. So doing dawah, at least part-time is fard on every Muslim. Doing full-time dawah is afzal. This, that is the highest profession that a Muslim can take is of a da'i. These are the ones who shall attain felicity. 
And Allah says in Surah Fusila, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Woman ahsanu qala mimman doila Allahi wa amilu salihau, qala innani minan muslimin, qala innani, wa qala innani minan muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites people to the way of their Lord, works righteousness and says that I'm a Muslim. Here Allah is saying in the Quran, that the best profession for a Muslim is inviting him, inviting people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inviting people to Islam. So the best profession is of a da'i. As for a Muslim living in a non-Muslim country, it is not advisable, you can refer to my other answer, but if you are living, doing da'wah is compulsory, all the more required than living in a Muslim country, and see to it that you follow the Quran and the Sayyidi. This was the last question that I could answer in the limited time. Inshallah, till we meet next Saturday for the program Al Dr. Zakir. Same time, Malaysia 11.30, Makkah time 6.30 and GMT 3.30. Till we meet again, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Barakatuh Wa Akhru Dawan Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.